Finnick O'Dare is another one of my favorite characters from the Hunger Games series. He has a very interesting story that really changed the entire tone of the books. He was played brilliantly by Sam Claflin, but just like the other Hunger Games characters that I made videos on, he wasn't entirely fleshed out in the films. In this video, I'm going to do what the films could not, and explain the entire life of Finnick O'Dare from the books. Finnick O'Dare was born in District 4, one of the wealthiest districts in Pan Am. He grew up surrounded by water, learning to swim, fish, tie knots, and use the weapon he became best at wielding, a trident. He was very athletic and very chiseled with solid abs. He was extremely handsome, with tanned skin, bronze hair, and especially stunning sea green eyes. Not only was he good looking, but he was very charming, witty, and seductive, and he would not be shy to tell you so. He prided himself on his ability to make almost anyone weak in the knees, specifically with women. In social settings, he was always relaxed, always smiling with his perfect teeth, and seemed like an open book, making him extremely easy to get along with. Finnick saw himself as shallow, which he flaunted on the surface, but if anyone took the time to get to know him, they would see that he has far more depth and cares for others more than he lets on. When Finnick was 14, he was chosen for the 65th Hunger Games. Even though District 4 was among the careers, meaning certain districts that train for the games at a young age and form alliances between the other career districts, the odds were against him as he was the youngest of all the tributes. Using context clues from the books, I think it's very possible that Finnick was among the kids training for the games at a young age based on his extreme strength, skill with the trident and fighting abilities, but I don't think he expected to go in as young as he did. I think he was going to keep training and then volunteer when he got older, but because his name was still in the jar just like everyone else, he was unexpectedly chosen. Mags, the winner of the 11th Hunger Games, became his mentor, and Finnick grew to have immense respect for her. He was obviously much bigger and stronger than her, so she could not teach him much physically, but she was able to teach him smaller things like basic survival skills. The capital fell in love with Finnick because of his good looks, seductive personality, and because he was so young. He was the center of the entertainment for the 65th Hunger Games. Because of this, he got loads of sponsors while in the arena without even trying. Because he was a career tribute, he teamed up with the other career districts. While other districts were pressed to get a handful of grain or some matches as a gift from a sponsor, Finnick never wanted anything, not food or medicine or weapons. He was able to get all of that by himself while in the arena. It took about a week for the other tributes to realize that Finnick was the one to kill, but by that time, it was too late. He was already deadly with the spears and knives that he had gotten from the cornucopia on his own. When he received a silver parachute with a trident, one of the most expensive of things a sponsor has ever sent into a Hunger Games arena, it was all over. He had used the trident for most of his life, and in the arena, it was like a natural, deadly extension of his arm. He used what Mags had taught him to weave a net out of some kind of vine that he had found. He used it to entangle his opponents, making it easy for him to spear them with his trident. Within a matter of days, the crown was his. He became the youngest ever victor, and from then on, was a living legend in Pan Am. With Finnick's popularity in the capital, with them practically drooling over him, President Snow, the leader of Pan Am, took advantage of his status, and more importantly, took advantage of him. He couldn't touch him at first because he was so young, but when Finnick turned 16, Snow sold him and his body to capital residents, serving him up for prostitution. At first, Finnick refused, but Snow threatened to kill his loved ones, and Finnick realized that he had no other choice. He felt degraded and felt a great deal of shame. Because he was so desirable, Snow gave him up as a reward and allowed people to buy him for a huge amount of money and did not give Finnick a cent of it. Finnick, however, was offered presents, money, and jewelry from the buyers, which he believes was more about the buyers making themselves feel better about the situation. Finnick refused all of those gifts, however. He found a much more valuable form of payment, secrets. He gained a wealth of information about prominent capital citizens, drunken secrets whispered over a damp pillowcase in the dead of night. He learned things like tales of sexual appetites, betrayals of the heart, bottomless greed, stories of incest, backstabbing, blackmail, arson, and bloody power plays. The buyers didn't think anything of telling Finnick. He was someone bought and sold, a district slave, a handsome one certainly, but in reality harmless. Who would he tell, and who would believe him if he did? 
There was one piece of dirt that took the cake, however. He had gotten dirt on President Snow himself, the man who forced him into prostitution. He learned that Snow used poison to kill a huge number of people as he made his way to the top, information Finnick will use to his advantage later. The general public did not know about Finnick's prostitution. Because of this, he got the reputation of having a parade of lovers in the capital, old or young, lovely or plain, rich or very rich. He was known to keep them company, but he never stayed, and once he was gone, he never came back. But most thought that this was his choice. No one knew that they weren't real lovers. Finnick mentored four years worth of tributes and tried to help them as best he could before they went into the arena. Five years after he won his games, a girl from District 4 named Annie Cresto was chosen as a tribute for the 70th Hunger Games. Finnick became her mentor and the two fell in love before she went into the arena. Finnick said that his love for her crept up on him. Watching her in the arena was torture for Finnick because all that he wanted was the love of his life to survive. Annie ended up winning, but she came out being driven into insanity after the horrors that she saw in the arena. This caused her to do odd things such as close her eyes and cover her ears, laugh at unusual times, and fall into a stupor periodically. Despite this, Phoenix still loved her and was the only one that could calm her down. The two were happy despite Annie's mental struggle. When the 75th Hunger Games came around, Snow announced that they would be choosing from the existing pool of victors to celebrate the third quarter quell. Finnick was picked for the male tribute to the delight of many capital citizens eager to see more of the handsome victor. Finnick accepted this and showed off for the cameras, but when Annie was chosen as the female tribute, his heart sank as Annie became hysterical. Luckily, Mags volunteered in her place, an act that gained even more of Finnick's respect than he already had for his former mentor. For the parade, Finnick's stylist draped him in a golden net that strategically knotted at his groin so that he can't technically be called naked, but was about as close as you could get. His stylist thought, the more of Finnick the audience sees, the better. Before the parade, Finnick went up to Katniss, the only person standing alone, and instead of introducing himself, he greeted her as if they had known each other for 10 years. Finnick licked his lips and played with Katniss's collar in a flirty way, something that failed to impress her, which Finnick was not used to. He then told Katniss, that she could have had all the jewels and money if not for the quarter quell. But Katniss shrugged him off and asked him what he did with his money. Finnick responded saying, I haven't dealt in anything as common as money in years. Well then how do people pay for the pleasure of your company? With secrets. He then asked Katniss if the girl on fire had any secrets worth his time. Katniss then said that she's an open book, and Finnick smiled saying, Unfortunately, I think that's true. When it came time for the interviews, Finnick recited a poem that he wrote for the love of his life, a ploy calculated to get the audience on his side, and it worked perfectly. The audience ate up his seductive charm. During training, Finnick went up to Katniss a few times, first to show her how to tie a knot that she was struggling with, and then to introduce her to Mags. Undenounced to Katniss, soon after being reaped, Finnick became part of the rebellion, working with Plutarch, that year's game maker, Haymitch, District 13, and a few others. Their goal was to keep Katniss and Peeta alive. When Katniss refused to ally herself with anyone, Haymitch gave Finnick his golden bracelet that Effie gave to him to let Katniss know that Finnick was on her side. Where did you get that? Where do you think? The arena had a lot of water and had a trident and net in the cornucopia, all clearly for Finnick, who was the audience favorite next to Peta and Katniss. Finnick saved both Katniss's life and Peta's life in the first few minutes of the games, and saved Peta again moments later, giving him mouth to mouth after he hit a force field. When Finnick went to give Peta mouth to mouth, Katniss tried to push him off, thinking that he was trying to kill Peta, but once she realized what he was actually doing, she stopped. Finnick helps Mags and a weak Peta, supporting both of their weights as they move through the jungle. When the first round of deaths are announced, Finnick, along with Mags, are very sad to see that Cedar, a mother of three, was killed. While they were sleeping, a dangerous acid fog comes toward them that not only burns their skin, but affects their nervous system, striking fear into them. The four of them run, Finnick carrying Mags on his back. When Peta's legs become paralyzed by the fog and Katniss can't support his weight, Finnick tells Katniss to switch with him, giving the 70-pound Mags to her while he carried Peta. Katniss, however, starts to struggle when her legs start shaking, and she begs Finnick to carry Mags too. Finnick starts crying, telling her that he can't. His arms weren't working and were shaking uncontrollably at his sides. He was desperate to save both Peta and Mags, but he just couldn't. Mags realizing this, kisses Finnick and then hobbles into the fog. Max? Finnick, Max! Max! Finnick watched as his mentor and friend died right in front of him. 
The three made sure that Mag's sacrifice wasn't for nothing, and eventually got away, entering the next section of the arena. Finnick wasn't able to move because he had breathed in too much of the fog carrying Mags and Peta. When Katniss realized that water healed it, she splashed water on Finnick's unmoving body, slowly making him regain control of his muscles. He's weary, but not because of running or from the fog, but because he had just seen Mags, one of his only friends, die. Katniss went from not trusting Finnick in the slightest and planning on killing him in his sleep to being extremely grateful to him after he selflessly saved both her and Peeta multiple times and risked his own life to do so. She of course did not know about the larger plan and the fact that Finnick's job was to keep them alive for the rebellion. Shortly after that, they're confronted by a pack of monkeys, and Finnick led the way, stabbing the monkeys with his trident, while Katniss and Peeta fought them with their bow and arrow and knife. They got away because of another tribute sacrificing their life to save Peeta. Finnick knew that she did that, for the larger picture of the rebellion, knowing that Katniss and Peeta were too important to let die. They were exhausted after the monkey attack, and unlike in the movie, in the books, they continue to walk through the jungle, looking for a big tree that they can get water out of. Katniss and Peeta rest, trusting Finnick to guard them. Finnick made nets and baskets, which he used to catch shellfish, and when Katniss woke up in the mid-morning, he greeted her with food. Katniss and Finnick tease each other about their hideous skin that they had acquired in the arena, and the two start to enjoy each other's company. They then get a parachute from a sponsor of a loaf of bread, sending the message that the crowd likes their alliance and thinks that they should continue being friends. The three later meet Joanna, Beatty, and Wyrus, and all six of them team up to form one big alliance. When Finnick sees Joanna, he runs to her yelling her name. Joanna! I guess we have more allies. He was excited to see her because she too was part of the rebellion. When Joanna talked to Katniss, she told her that even though Finnick was his cool and calm self, he was hurting inside and explains that Mags was his former mentor and half his family. Later on, once they discovered that the center of the arena was a clock, they went there and were attacked by careers. Enoberia threw a knife into Finnick's thigh. They kill a few careers and eventually chase Enoberia and Brutus away. Finnick, still with the injury on his thigh, had to dive into the water to save Beatty. While in the jungle, Finnick heard Annie's screams. Terrified that she was in the arena being tortured, he ran toward the screaming. When Katniss sees the Jabberjay that's making this noise, she shoots it down, stopping Annie's screams. Finnick is still terrified though, and thinks that the game makers had kidnapped and tortured their loved ones. Not her. How do you think they got that sound? Jabberjay's copy. When Finnick and Katniss looked over at the others, they realized that there was a force field between them, and they couldn't communicate for the rest of the hour. In that hour, they heard the constant screams of their loved ones. The hour passed, painfully slow. When Katniss found out who Annie was, she gained even more respect for Finnick because he truly cared about a lonely, unstable girl when he could have had any beautiful woman he wanted. That night, while Finnick was sleeping, he had nightmares about Annie and called out her name in his sleep. Katniss is again impressed because she knows that there's no way to keep up an act in one's sleep. This proved that he truly had compassion for this girl. Later on, the group comes up with a plan to use wire that Beatty invented and attach it to a tree that gets hit by lightning at a certain time of day to kill the remaining tributes. Finnick, Beatty, and Peta went to the tree while Katniss and Joanna went to the beach to put the wire on the sand. The plan went wrong, however. The wire was cut and Joanna knocked Katniss out to take the tracker out of her arm. Finnick worried for Joanna's life, ran through the jungle screaming her name. He eventually heard Katniss's voice, and he turned around to run in that direction. As he did so, he ran into Enoberia. She too was following Katniss's voice, and they race each other there. When they get to the tree, they don't see Katniss until she shoots an arrow, sending Finnick, Enoberia, Beatty, and Katniss flying back as the arena is destroyed. A ship from the Rebellion in District 13 comes down and rescues Finnick along with Katniss and Beatty. They're taken out of the arena and back to the rebel base in District 13. Finnick discusses strategy with Plutarch and Haymitch on the way there, and Katniss wakes up. They explain to her what's going on. Finnick apologizes to Katniss for failing to get Peta. As punishment for Finnick working with the rebels, Snow had Annie arrested and taken to the capital. There, she was tortured and was used as a way to psychologically torture Finnick. Finnick told Katniss that he was worried Annie would say something that could be constructed as treasonous due to her minds not being all the way there. The capital knew that Finnick would not endanger Annie by telling her anything, but they took her anyway simply to use her as a weapon against Finnick. It worked and Finnick had a mental breakdown. He became deeply depressed and slightly unhinged, unable to focus on anything but saving Annie. 
Snow knew that by keeping Annie alive, he made Finnick, one of the Rebels' most valuable members, weak, unconcentrated, and would make him question his loyalty to the Rebels. To keep himself sane, he tied knots in a length of rope, which distracted him from the horrors going on inside his head. After Finnick talked to Katniss about the situation, Katniss ordered President Coyne, the president of 13, to put Annie on the list of people to save, which Finnick was very grateful for. BD made Finnick a new state-of-the-art trident, but Finnick wasn't in the right state of mind to even visit the weapons room. Violence was what caused both his and Annie's minds to snap, and was the reason why Annie was being tortured at the Capitol. They all decide that Katniss needed to go out in the field to be inspirational, and Finnick finally feels well enough to join her. BD gives him his new trident, which cheers him up almost immediately. Here, we finally see his old energy and the enthusiasm that he had before the last Hunger Games. It's clear that Finnick has become so used to combat at this point that he can't really live without it. It always comes back to him. He only knows how to fight violence with more violence, which is the reason why the new weapon cheered him up. After getting the trident, Finnick starts suffering from mental relapses to his time in the Hunger Games and becomes very unstable. During Katniss's mission, she ends up getting shot, and while she was in the hospital, Finnick paid her a visit. He himself was still not okay mentally, and was very unstable while talking to Katniss. While he was there, the two of them watched PETA being interviewed on TV while he was in the Capitol. When PETA says directly to Katniss to stop fighting, Finnick quickly turns the TV off. Finnick goes out of his way to make sure that PETA isn't brought up by anyone in 13 for the rest of the night, which Katniss is very grateful for. The following day, Finnick and Katniss got permission to walk into the woods outside of District 13. Here they take this opportunity of not being observed to discuss PETA's broadcast, and neither of them are sure what to think of the interview. When Katniss started to struggle with snow getting in her head, and with her knowing that PETA was being tortured because of her, Finnick stepped up and was there for her. He too felt that way about Annie, and to calm Katniss down, he passed on his rope tying activity. The two grow even closer as they share the same guilty feelings that their loved ones are being hurt because of them, and there was nothing that they could do about it. Finnick later worked with the Rebels production team and made a propo of his own in which he talked about Rue's death, and it had a big impact on all of Pan Am, the districts, and the capital. Later on, the Rebels put together a team that would later on rescue Annie, Peta, and Joanna. Finnick and Katniss step up to do more propos that will act as a distraction for when the team infiltrates the capital. Plutarch calls Hamish and Finnick over, and they have a brief but intense conversation, which Hamish becomes unhappy about. Finnick turns pale, but nods his head agreeing with Plutarch. As Finnick moves to take the seat in front of the camera, Hamish says to him that he doesn't have to do this, and Finnick responds saying, Yes I do, if it will help her. He was of course referencing Annie. Finnick then filmed a propo to tell the whole country about how Snow offered him up for prostitution and how he was paid with secrets. He started to expose many prominent people in the capital, and when he got to Snow himself, he exposed him for using poison to rise to power. Poison perfect weapon for a snake. Even members of the rebellion who were in the room had shocked looks on their face. Finnick's words sent a wave of shock across the entire country. When Finnick finished, they kept the cameras rolling until he himself said, cut and he stood up and walked away. When the rescue team was sent out, they aired the propos. Finnick and Katniss anxiously waited, tying knots, going to the weapons room to blow stuff up, and later, they tried to station themselves in command, where surely first word of the rescue would come, but they were kicked out. While they continued to wait, Katniss asked Finnick questions about Annie, which Finnick answered honestly, admitting that his love for her crept up on him. Hamish interrupted them, however, telling them that they had returned and that the mission was successful. Katniss jumped up, but Finnick was unable to move. Katniss had to grab his hand and lead him. When Finnick entered the room, Annie called out for him. Finnick! It was as if there was no one else in the world but these two, crashing through space to reach each other. They collide and fold, lose their balance, and slam against the wall where they stay, clinging into one being, indivisible. Shortly after this, Finnick proposes to Annie, and she immediately says yes. Their wedding cake was decorated with waves of dolphins made by Peta. Annie's dress was made by Cinna, taken from Katniss's house back in Victor's village, and almost every kid in 13 volunteered to sing District 4's wedding song. It was an event that put a smile on everyone's face, something that was needed desperately. The wedding was also filmed, and was used by the rebels for propaganda. After they got married, Katniss noticed that Finnick hadn't let go of Annie's hand since. 
minutes. Annie returning had made Finnick calmer and more stable, and it brought the old Finnick back out of his shell. A short while after they were married, Annie became pregnant with their child, something that warmed both of their hearts. Later on, Finnick becomes part of a team that includes Katniss, Boggs, Gale, the TV crew, and a few others, and their mission is to infiltrate the capital. Finnick did not tell Annie about the mission, just that he was going away. Finnick later finds out that Katniss told the same thing to her family, something that makes them bond more. The mission was very reminiscent of them heading into the arena one last time. Ladies and gentlemen, Welcome to the 76 Hunger Games. They had a hologram of the plans called a hollow that could self-destruct if the word Nightlock was said three times. The hollow showed all of the pods or booby traps that were in their path. The team later finds out that they aren't actually on a real mission. They're just there to shoot more propos and are miles behind the actual fight. PETA eventually joins the group, something that everyone is furious about due to PETA being brainwashed by Snow to want to kill Katniss. One night, when Katniss was on watch, Finnick saw PETA get up and join her, and he watched carefully to make sure that he didn't do anything. When PETA says that he doesn't know who to trust anymore, Finnick comes out and joins the two, telling PETA that he's among friends in this group. The team shoots a lot of footage for Propos, including Finnick along with Katniss and Gale shooting a nearby building. Katniss later takes control of the group and changes the mission to head towards Snow. Finnick and the others follow her lead despite other team members' doubts. The group decides to move through tunnels underground to avoid any danger above. While walking down there, Finnick pulled Katniss aside a split second before she was hit by a beam of light, saving her life. The beam of light would later melt the flesh off of another team member's body. A squad of mutant soldiers with long reptilian tails later comes out and attacks them while they're underground. The team struggles to hold them off, and there's a huge fight. Go, go, go! They eventually find a tunnel out and climb up the ladder. Finnick is one of the last to climb up, and as Gale gets pulled up, Finnick screams. Finnick struggles to hang onto the ladder as three mutts tear at him. One yanks back his head, ready to give the killing blow, and Finnick's life flashes before his eyes. He sees the mast of a boat, a silver parachute, Mags laughing, a pink sky, the trident Beatty made for him, Annie in her wedding dress, waves breaking over rocks. He suddenly gets swarmed by the mutants and screams in agony. He just wants the pain to end. Katniss sees this, then drops the hollow after saying Nightlock three times, and it self-destructs, taking Finnick out of his misery, killing him along with all the mutts. The rebels eventually capture Snow, and President Coin asks the remaining victors if they want to have one more Hunger Games, but with the capital's children. Annie votes no, and passionately says that Finnick would say the same thing if he was still alive. Annie would return to District 4, where she would give birth to her and Finnick's son. She sent a picture to Katniss and Peeta in District 12, which warms both of their hearts as they see how much he looks like his father. Katniss and Peeta would later make a book in memory of everyone that died. They found or painted a picture of their fallen loved ones and wrote the details about them that it would be a crime to forget. One thing they remember for Finnick was his sea green eyes, and later they add the picture that Annie had sent them of her and Finnick's son. Finnick was put through tremendous pain and suffering, and to most of the world, he came off as selfish and shallow. But for those who got to know the real Finnick, they would realize that he was quite the opposite. He was selfless, constantly putting his life on the line to save others, helped people through tough times, and saw the beauty in people that no one else could see. He saw past people's flaws and chose to see the good in them. He touched the hearts of all those that were lucky enough to get close to him, and he will forever be remembered as a hero. Thank you so much for watching, guys. You can follow me on social media. Links for that will be down below. If you like this video, make sure you press that subscribe button to help grow the channel. I want to give a huge shout out to all my Patreons listed below. If you want to be listed on my next video, check out my Patreon. You'll be featured on the video and get a bunch of other rewards as well. Again, thank you so much for watching and look out for more great videos on the way.